Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on Governmental Operation. I am Fernando Cabrera, the chair of the committee. Today the committee will be considering two bills. The first bill, proposed introduction number 1249A, sponsored by myself, will streamline two overlapping TLC programs to make them more effective and transparent as vital vision zero enforcement tools. The second item is introduction number 991, sponsored by myself, in relations to requiring the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to dismiss a taxi and a limousine commission related violation pertaining to vehicle lights upon proof of timely correction. First, let me acknowledge my colleagues, colleague, uh, who uh, is with us here today, and as always, in a timely fashion, Council Member Yeager, it's good to see you again. Uh, TLC maintains two enforcement programs that result in points on a driver's licenses, which can lead to license suspension or revocation. In the early 1990s, the TLC created the Persistent Violators Program. This program assigns points to licensed drivers for various TLC rules violation. Drivers who accumulate a number of points within a 15 month period face either license suspension if they accumulate six points or revocation if they accumulate 10 points. The second program is the critical drivers program. This program operates exactly as the persistent violators program but takes into account the points assigned by the state's department of motor vehicles for certain traffic violation. This program is important because DMV points represent the bulk of points issue. Up into 2014, these two programs were separate. Local law 30, uh, 2014 changed this to allow TLC to count both TLC issue points and DMV issue points for enforcement purposes against drivers. This was an important change because it avoided a loophole where, for example, a driver could have more than 10 points total, but less than 10 points in each program, thus will, would not have his or her license revoked. However, the way this was done, while certainly well many, has created confusion in the industry. Some drivers feel like they are penalized twice for the same offense. Other drivers feel like TLC is using the two programs as ways to raise revenue instead of keeping bad drivers off the road by offering settlements instead of suspensions or revocation. Even the TLC Commissioner, uh, Mayor Joshi, testified at Council hearing that the critical driver program is very confusing, that it does not do what it's intended to do, that drivers often feel like they are getting two tickets for the same act. At the hearing, the TLC commissioner urged the council to take up this issue. So we are here today to do just that. We want to hear from the administration, drivers, the industry and safety street safety advocates on how these programs have worked in practice, what there is confusion, what is this committee and the council can do to make things better. Proposed intro 1249A is a first attempt to address the issue in a concrete way. It is intended to streamline the two programs in order to make the system more transparent, thus, thus more effective as a vision zero tool. This bill will consolidate the critical driver program under the persistent violators program while retaining all of the essential vision zero elements of the critical driver program, mainly counting the DMV points to make sure that nothing of substance is lost and to make sure that TLC does not lose any enforcement tools. Let me be clear that the intent of this legislation is not to reduce safety or roll back the measures that the city has successfully implemented under Vision Zero. Far from it, instead, the intent is to bring clarity to this enforcement mechanism in a way that makes all New Yorkers, whether drivers, passengers, or pedestrians, better off. If drivers don't understand why they are being penalized, the penalty cannot be an effective deterrent to dangerous driving. Finally, the other bill being heard today, introduction number 991, will require the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings Oath to dismiss a violation enforced by the TLC pertaining to a driver's defective vehicle license 
if the driver proves that the problem was corrected in a timely manner. This is a matter of ensuring that our streets remain safe. Drivers are not off the hook for fixing their tail lights or other vehicle lights. Instead, this law would encourage them to make those repairs immediately while ensuring that they are not drowning under the weight of violations that are easily fixable and, and can keep them from making an honest living. I thank the administration for being here with us today and for your attention to this issue. I look forward to your testimony. I also want to thank our committee staff, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjohn, Zach Harris, and Elliot Lynn, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible. And now I would uh, invite forward, I want to thank the administration for allowing uh, this first speaker to come first, Jeanette William from Family for, for Safe uh, Streets. Uh, to come forward. You could begin as soon as you're ready. If you could uh, press the, the button. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Jeanette Williams, and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets. My son, Troy Williams, was killed by a hit-and-run driver on March 1, 2018, on Cedric Avenue near Undercliff in the Bronx. I received a telephone call from the police around 2 a.m. stating that Troy was dead. This is a day I will never forget. My, the past 10 months has been so devastating. I feel as if I'm in, in a never-ending dream and can't wake up. Troy's death made me understand how it feels to have a broken heart. Truly, my heart is broken, and I don't know how or when it will ever be mended. Troy was the father of four young men and the grandfather of a grandson and a granddaughter who will never have the opportunity to know him. He also left a younger brother and a host of other family members and friends. Troy was my firstborn son. He and I had a wonderful relationship, which meant more to me than anything in the world. Troy was a wonderful guy that cared about others and often put them before himself. He was a funny guy who loved to have fun and his smile would light up any room that he entered. My son was a hard worker and at the time of his death, he was employed at Columbia University as a fire safety officer. Troy was a graduate of John Jay College and continued to advance his career. Troy also volunteered at with boys at the Harlem Jets Athletic League and Hol Holcomb Rucker Community League. At Troy's homecoming service, I was able to see how many lives he had touched in his short time on this earth. Though his life came to a tragic ending, I am able to hold on to the wonderful things that he accomplished in his life. Through my sorrow, I have chosen to work with Families for Safe Streets to advocate for change. I'm here today to remind everyone how important it is, how important it is to support legislation that prevents these senseless deaths. We are horrified to see the original version of this legislation that would have weakened, that would have been weakened by TLC's effort to get dangerous drivers off the, off the road. Professional drivers have an obligation to be the safest drivers in NYC streets. We are pleased that this version maintains the critical enforcement role because we need to be doing more, not taking steps backward. backward. I hope some, someone, someone here today from the City Council can also help me pressure the police to find, find who was responsible for killing my son. I have heard nothing from NYPD and cannot even get them to certify the cause of death. Finally, I. I welcome you. Um, finally, I welcome your help fighting for better lighting, more speed cameras, and other traffic safety measures in that area and other areas throughout the city to prevent any other family from experiencing the devastation that me and my family have endured for the past year. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, I can only imagine. I'm looking at the picture over here of, of your son. Actually, you don't live too far. You're in the district, council member district below mine, council member Gibson uh, is your council member, but uh, not too far, literally, from where I live. Uh, 
I can only imagine how you feel, how tragic it was. I know you carry him, think about him every single day. And we are going to continue, I know, for your whole organization uh, that both of you here today and under your leadership, we're going to make sure that uh, every piece of legislation we pass here is, is, will pass under the bar of safety. Safety must come first. That's the first role of government, to make sure that we have safety. Uh, and we appreciate your input on the first version of the bill. We made uh, revisions, and um, it's a stronger, better uh, bill. And I uh, appreciate your support. Uh, both of you and your whole organization uh, keep up the really tremendous work that you're doing. And uh, I'll, I'll definitely uh, I hear your cry regarding justice um, to communicate with Councilmember Gibson uh, to, you know, to help and to bridge uh, level of communication with the NYPD. Um, the, at the very least, they should be communicating uh, you know what's going on on a weekly basis uh, because a life was taken uh, and it should have not happened and justice must uh, be brought to pass uh, so uh, I don't know if the council member have a question comment okay so thank you so much we really really appreciate it thank you for being a champion don't stop please don't stop what you're doing matters you're making a difference. You're already making a difference in today's hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. God bless you. So at this moment, we're going to be calling uh, the administration, and we're going to start with uh, Madeline Labad Labadi, Senior Advisor for Strategic Initiative from the TLC. Uh, John Costello from Oath, Amy Slifka from Oath, and Leandra Estauche. If I butcher your name, please I apologize. Um, uh, from the TLC, Managing Attorney Prosecution Unit from TLC, and our counsel will swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yeah. Thank you. You may begin. Is it on now? Great. Um, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and uh, members of the Government Oper Operations Committee, um, as well as the Safe Streets Advocates I see here today. My name is Madeline Labadee. I'm the Senior Advisor for Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I serve as TLC's Vision Zero Program Lead. Joining me is Leandra Eustache, Managing Attorney for TLC's Prosecution Unit, and we are here to get, uh, together today to provide an overview of TLC's Critical Driver and Persistent Violator Programs and to give our views on the intros number uh, 1249A and intro number 991. On February 18, 2014, Mayor de Blasio launched the Vision Zero Initiative, a comprehensive plan to end traffic fatalities in New York City. The message of Vision Zero is that traffic crashes that kill or seriously injure New Yorkers and visitors are preventable. The city's Vision Zero work focuses on education, enforcement, and engineering to drive down the number of serious crashes. This means ensuring that drivers are paying attention to the rules of the road. For five years, the Vision Zero initiative has succeeded in reducing traffic fatalities on New York City streets each year, in contrast with other large cities throughout the country where crash rates have increased. This success is due to the effective coordination of many city agencies, including the Department of Transportation, the Police Department, and the TLC, the key transportation stakeholders, advocates, industry groups, and the public. As a regulatory agency, the TLC has an obligation to ensure that each passenger's riding experience is safe, reliable, and accessible. The city charter gives the TLC the power to establish and enforce the rules and regulations necessary to protect drivers, passengers, and members of the public. TLC rules and the New York State Vehicle and Traffic Law are enforced in the field by TLC's 200 enforcement officers and the NYPD. 
The NYPD, with its much larger force, issues the majority of traffic violations received by TLC licensed drivers. Along with the NYPD and DOT, TLC is one of the three lead Vision Zero agencies and our role regulating the largest professional fleet in New York City, which includes over 135,000 vehicles and 200,000 drivers, is critical to the city's Vision Zero success. TLC's licensed drivers cover over two billion miles each year, meaning they have a big impact on New York City streets. Our mission is to hold all TLC licensed drivers to a high standard so that the TLC driver license is synonymous with safety. As an agency, we do this by requiring safe driving education, by developing pilot programs exploring in-vehicle technologies to deter unsafe driving patterns, and by incentivizing safe driving via positive reinforcement uh, through our annual uh, driver honor roll, which recognizes our safest drivers. Although the majority of TLC drivers are safe, in fact, 95% of TLC licensed drivers maintained a safe driving record in 2018, there are outliers who are not. It's imperative to identify those drivers immediately and if necessary, remove them from the road before a tragedy occurs. The council provides TLC with several important tools that support the mayor's Vision Zero agenda, including the Critical Driver Program, which monitors DMV violations committed by drivers, and the Persistent Violator Program, which tracks TLC violations committed by drivers. The Critical Driver Program authorizes TLC to suspend or revoke the TLC driver licenses of drivers who accumulate too many DMV points on their state-issued driver's licenses. DMV points are given for dangerous moving violations, such as speeding, failure to yield to a pedestrian, and running stoplights or stop signs. The TLC license points are accrued for similar traffic safety violations, as well as violations that put passengers at risk. Through the Persistent Violator Program, the TLC holds drivers to a high standard through retraining, suspension, or license revocation against drivers who accrue too many TLC license points. The TLC enforces this strict standard as a frontline protection for the public. Under the Critical Driver Program, if a driver receives six DMV points within a 15-month period, TLC can suspend the driver's TLC license. If the driver accrues 10 DMV points within a 15-month period, TLC can revoke the driver's TLC license. The Persistent Violator Program works the same way, except with TLC points. Only 5% of drivers received any penalties under these programs last year because most maintain safe driving records. We know that traffic safety violations and serious crashes are correlated. TLC analysis found that TLC licensed drivers who received at least one traffic safety violation for dangerous driving behaviors that accrued DMV points, such as speeding or running red lights, were subsequently involved in 85% of all crashes that led to injuries or fatalities. The critical driver and persistent violator programs are supported by evidence as effective enforcement tools to prevent crashes from happening in the first place. As a sign of City Council and the administration's partnership on Vision Zero, the Council passed Local Law 30 in 2014. The bill directed TLC to combine TLC points and DMV points for purposes of suspension or revocation. So if a driver was issued violations by a combination of TLC officers and police officers, the driver wouldn't be treated differently than if all the points had been issued by the same agency. After voice, uh, voicing our significant concerns last month, we received intro number 1240, when, when we received uh, intro 1249 version A, which reverses the serious negative safety implications of the original bill. Uh, intro 1249 would have eliminated the city's ability to use the critical driver program to get dangerous drivers off the road. The amended version, however, restores this power by combining critical driver and persistent violator programs under one title. Substantively, this revised legislation does not change TLC's ability to suspend or revoke the TLC driver license of drivers who accumulate too many TLC or DMV points for dangerous moving violations, while it ensures TLC licensees understand their safety obligations as professional drivers. The Mayor and City Council have made great strides in reducing traffic fatalities in the last five years, and there's still much work to do. Working together, I know we can continue to make the city's streets safer. My colleague, Leander Eustache, will now provide testimony on intro number 991. Thank you, Madeline. 
Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Leandra Eustace and I'm the managing attorney for TLC's prosecution unit. Intro number 991 would require the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to dismiss the violation enforced by the TLC for defective vehicle lights as soon as the driver provides proof that the defect has been corrected no later than one half hour after sunset on the first full business day after the date of the violation. The forms of proof include statements from DMV inspectors, fleet operators, direct inspection of the vehicle by oath, and evidence acceptable to the tribunal from any person that such person made the correction together with proof of purchase of any equipment needed to make such correction. We support Council's intent in intro number 991 to provide our licensees with an opportunity to correct a violation without penalty rather than having to pay a fine. However, we think by working together that we can improve the introduction as currently drafted so that those changes would be beneficial for all drivers. For example, the introduction as currently written could be read as applying to only those summonses issued by a TLC enforcement officer. As other enforcement agencies issue TLC summonses such as the NYPD, the Port Authority, and MTA, we feel intro number 991 should be drafted to clearly apply to all TLC summonses, irrespective of, the issue, irrespective of the issuing enforcement agency. Additionally, we would encourage simplifying the process through which a driver can demonstrate that a light was fixed through the use of a TLC condition corrective receipt, which is a form of proof regularly used by TLC and accepted by oath hearing officers to show a vehicle defect was fixed. We are committed to working together with you, Chair Cabrera, to ensure the text of intro 991 and the TLC's implement, implementation of it benefit drivers and address vehicle violations quickly in the interest of safety. Thank you for inviting us to testify today and uh, we will now pass it over to Oak. Good afternoon, Council Member Cabrera. Council Member, um, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Commissioner Del Valle, who would have been here if he could, but obviously he's been away on a personal emergency medical leave. But he does have tremendous respect for this committee, for the work that you've done. Council Member Yeager, Council Member Mizell, uh, Council Member Powers, um, and uh, he wanted me to, to express that res respect that he has for everyone and the great work that you've been doing. <laughs> Sitting to my left is Deputy Commissioner Amy Slifka. She's de uh, Deputy Commissioner Slifka is the uh, uh, head of Oaths Hearings Division, and I'm going to read. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to read into uh, the record uh, the testimony on behalf of Commissioner Del Valle. The in connection with the intro 991, in, and the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings Oath is the city's independent administrative law court. In 1979, Mayor Koch established oath by executive order with the goal that there be, would be, would eventually be one centralized administrative law court to adjudicate cases. The Health Tribunal, Taxi and Limousine Tribunal, and Environmental Control Board were subsequently transferred into oath in accordance with Mayor de Blasio's overall commitment to provide city residents and small businesses with an administrative law process that is impartial and fair Oath established a trials division and hearings division to ensure a more streamlined administrative law court. Oath's trials division, administrative law judges serve five-year terms, one more year than the mayor, and adjudicate the more complicated cases, including New York City civil servant disciplinary cases, law floor cases, city contracts disputes, city-issued licenses, disciplinary, I'm sorry, d discrimination cases under the city human rights law and lobbyist registration cases, among others. Oaths Hearings Division adjudicates summonses issued to residents and small businesses by New York City enforcement agencies, including, among others, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Transportation, Department of Sanitation, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Buildings, Fire Department of New York, Taxi and Limousine Commission, and the New York City De Police Department. Oaths mandate is to foster judicial professionalism, fairness, impartiality, equality, and a commitment to the integrity of the administrative law judicial decision-making process. As the city's administrative law court, OAT's function is to provide due process in cases that originate from the city's numerous enforcement agencies in a fair and impartial forum that is also convenient and accessible to the public. Oath has been working for the past four years to consolidate adjudications and improve court services to ensure greater transparency, equity, and fairness for city residents and small businesses. 
Now, in regards to intro 991, this bill in its current draft seeks to require that upon proof of corrections, oath dismiss taxi and limousine commission issued summonses for violations pertaining to inoperable vehicle lights. In particular, section 19-902 of this bill seeks to clarify 35 RCNY section 80-22B of the rules of the City of New York by granting to oath hearings division hearing officers the authority to dismiss a violation enforced by the TLC where a driver fails to personally inspect and reasonably determine whether the driver's vehicle lights are in working order if the driver corrects the violation within one half hour after sunset on the first full business day after the violation occurred and presents proof of the correction to oath on or before the hearing date. As drafted, evidence ascertained and evaluated outside of the hearing does not comport with Oates' mission to provide due process to the parties appearing before the hearing officer. Whether any proof of correction, I'm sorry, before the hearing officer. Moreover, the petitioner agency, in this case the TLC, must have an opportunity to rebut or further examine on the record before the hearing officer whether any proof of correction submitted by a respondent driver is satisfactory in order to comply with the due process requirements. Furthermore, section 19-902A5 of this bill seeks to require that oath exclusively accept from the respondent evidence that a correction was made. As an administrative law court, oath does not have any regulatory function. Oath's powers are exclusive to adjudications. The legal authority to regulate the safety standards of the for hire vehicle industry resides within TLC and correction of a condi condition resulting in a summons also lies within the administrative agency that has the expertise to make such a determination pursuant to the applicable law. That said, oath regularly encounters corrections and mitigation of penalties for summonses issued by other enforcement agencies. For instance, certification of corrections of violations of the respective codes enforced by the Department of Buildings and Fire Department of New York must be approved by DOB and FDNY pursuant to the building code and fire code, respectively in order for it to be sufficient as proof of correction. If certification of correction is not approved by the respective agency pre-hearing, then the respondent can present such evidence of correction at the hearing. Such evidence must comport with the regulatory agency's standards so as to constitute a cure or other mitigation of penalties. The enforcement agency then agrees or moves to amend the charge or penalty or otherwise withdraw the summons. Oath renders a decision and penalty or not based on some combination of proof of correction and review of the enforcement agency that has the expertise in this area. Similarly, Oath does not have the regulatory power, expertise, nor capability to inspect repairs as provided in section 19-902A6. Technically ascertaining whether a vehicle is roadworthy exceeds the authority and expertise of the administrative law court. Oath is exclusively responsible for weighing the sufficiency of evidence presented at the hearing and applying the applicable law. Finally, Oath is committed to providing greater access to justice by improving the efficiency and timeliness of adjudications without impairing due process. And again, the chair and members of this committee are commended, as always, for the fantastic work they have done to further this commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony, and I know your commissioners couldn't be here today, uh, given my uh, regards and uh, my great admiration for the work that they do and you all do. Uh, let me just uh, recognize that we were joined by Councilmember Mysell and Councilmember Powers, and, and let me just turn it over to Councilmember Yeager. He has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for Deputy Commissioner of Oath. Um, I read your testimony before you uh, delivered it, and I listened intently, and I'm, I'm trying to understand if, if you're indicating that the council does not have the authority to, uh, to pass a law that would require that you accept as evidence of a correction and thus dismiss the summons uh, as stated in the statute the tribunal shall dismiss a violation. It seems to me from your testimony that what you're saying is um, the petitioner agency must have an opportunity to rebut or further examine on the record before the hearing officer whether any offer of proof of correction submitted by a respondent driver is satisfactory in order to comply with due process requirements. My question to you, sir, is why? Uh, 
Why must the petitioner have the ability to question the evidence when the counsel says that your agency, the adjudicatory body, shall accept it? Well, it's a good question, council member. Um, I wanna thank you for that question because it, the core of the issue here is whether or not Oath as, a, as the city's administrative law court has the expertise to make a determination. It comes down to whether uh, Oath should get into that area and no administrative law court as far as I'm aware of in, in the history of the city uh, has taken a uh, position that would allow them to act as experts. Commissioner, we're not asking you to act as experts and we're not asking you to investigate the car and we're not asking you to go down and flick the lights on and off. What we're saying is if a piece of document is offered by a respondent and your judge looks at it and the judge says the document doesn't appear to be fraudulent, it doesn't appear to be uh, created by the driver, it surely appears to comport with the various different provisions of the statute, then a dismissal shall thereafter follow. And what I'm trying to understand is why you're inserting into the statute something that we didn't say. We're not saying that the agency has to have the ability to, uh, to contest this document. What we're saying is we're taking it out of the petitioner's hands. Sorry for not affording the TLC due process, but in our view, the TLC doesn't need to have due process when it comes to something as simple as a light correction that's made within 24 hours plus a half hour after sunset. And I'm not sure why you're reading something in that was not the intent of the council. The council's intent is that this document is presented. There are several different means by which a driver can authenticate to the satisfaction of the judge. And obviously, the judge maintains the authority to look at the document and say, I'm sorry, respondent, but this looks like it's fraudulent. I'm not going to accept it. But other than that, to the extent that the document meets any of the various criteria of the uh, statute, the agency, the, uh, the judge will accept it, and thereafter, a dismissal will follow. I'm really not sure I understand the objection. Well, I wouldn't say it's an objective, uh, objection per se. I would say it's a clarification here that our position as an administrative law court is not to uh, make the standards or determine standards for what is acceptable. That's, that's so. what we do. We, we right. do that. We're saying we, we don't do that. No, we do that here. This body, the 51 right. of us that went to the voters and took their votes Absolutely. and took an oath and came here, we set the standards. Yes. You enforce the standards. Well, and what we're saying is the standard is going to be a document issued by the police officer that a necessary correction has been made or evidence acceptable to the tribunal, you can make a rule that says you don't have it, you're not going to accept evidence other than what's in the statute. But we have put forth uh, a series of different kinds of evidence that are going to be acceptable to the tribunal and since we make the policy here and you enforce the policy, your judges will thereafter dismiss the summons upon such time as the evidence is presented, notwithstanding that the TLC hasn't gone and flicked the lights on and off, notwithstanding that the judge hasn't gone down to the car, flicked the lights on and off. We're trying to make things easier. Right. We're trying to make it easier, not just for the driver, but we're trying to make it easier for the petitioning agency, and we're trying to make it easier for the court, where the court receives a document that says, this is corrected. The court says, corrected, dismissed, everybody move about their day. The, the problem here is yes, the statute actually doesn't, it says it provides it to the tribunal. It doesn't say at a hearing. So when you say to the tribunal, who are you referring to? Would an administrative clerk be looking at this? Because the point is that we have to have a hearing one way or the other. Whether you leave it within the discretion of the hearing officer to review the documents that you um, set out here, at this point in time, there's no, there's no, it's not getting to a hearing officer the, currently the way the statute is written. We are authorizing you within 180 days after this becomes law for you to take such measures as are necessary for the implementation of the local law, including the promulgation of rules prior to such date or thereafter, if that's what it takes you, if it takes you more than 180 days, promulgate the rules accordingly, figure out how to do it, 
you're the court, decide what it is you wish to do. If you wish it to be an administrative dismissal by a clerk, then such is it. If you wish it for, for it to be an administrative hearing on paper, then such is it. If you, wish it for, for it. if you wish for it to be an administrative hearing in the sense that the driver has to actually walk in, swear under oath that this is a true document, and submit it, that's your authority to make the rule. If we don't like your rule, we'll get together right here in this beautiful chamber, and we'll enact the statute that fixes the rule that you've done. But I don't know how this statute can possibly be clearer than it is, um, with the exception of the testimony from the TLC, uh, where the TLC requests that we make it clear that it applies to all issuing agency. I don't know that it's not clear that it does, but we, we can certainly, uh, I'm sure the chair whose, uh, whose statute uh, this is, can certainly make that adjustment. But the reason that I signed on to this is because it looked to me like such a common sense thing, a common sense thing. A guy has his left rear light not working. He gets pulled over because the TLC guys have a quota that they have to meet, and they see that his brake light's not on. And they write him up. And he immediately, well, I didn't know it was broken. It just happened. It's snowing outside. It's freezing. The bulb cracked. And he goes to the mechanic, and he gets it fixed that day or the next day before a half hour prior to sunset. And he gets a, a, a letter signed by the mechanic and an invoice and a receipt showing that he paid $112 to fix the light. And he goes down to the court and he says, I fixed my broken light, dismiss the summons. That's the way the city's supposed to work. The mayor said a couple of weeks ago, this is the fairest big city in the world. Is it not the fairest big city in the world? This is such a simple thing. We're trying to make a court work more efficiently for the agency, for the, for the driver, and for the court, and for the taxpayers. And I really don't understand, I really, really don't understand why you're looking to create a problem with a statute that seems to be so clear to me. Cur currently, actually, there's a protocol in place that I think um, Taxi can speak to. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, and thank you for your uh, question, Council member. Uh, so TLC actually does currently operate what we call our Notice of Violation Program. Uh, and under this program, TLC enforcement officers who observe certain equipment violations in the field, uh, they do have discretion to issue a Notice of Violation. And what a Notice of Violation does, it gives the vehicle owner an opportunity to correct the violation, bring the vehicle back to TLC's uh, Woodside Inspection Facility, and completely avoid being issued a summons entirely so they don't face a, a fine, or, and they, they don't get issued a summons, so they get to um, avoid the entire oath adjudication pr process completely. Okay, so you have a process that requires the driver to, besides getting his light fixed, to come back to the TLC so that you guys can go and flick the light on and off. Uh, cor correct. Okay, we're saying no thank you. Thank you very much, but no thank you. We're not interested in that. What we're looking for is a simple, streamlined process where a driver can get evidence that he has fixed the light, just like if I am pulled over for having a broken tail light and I get a moving violation, I can go down to the, the uh, DMV court and present to the judge evidence that I fixed the light within a day and I'll get the summons dismissed as well. We're offering the Taxi and Limousine Commission the same opportunity to streamline your bureaucracy and to streamline the court so that and I really don't understand what it is that we're looking for. Is it, is it that you don't want to let it go, that you want the ability to control whether or not there's a dismissal, that only the TLC should be able to do that? You, want it, you don't want the court to have that authority? What is it that you're looking for? I'm trying to understand the objection from two agencies, the court and the petitioner. The respondents are not here to tell us why they support it. We think we understand why they would. Uh, thank you, council member. So, TLC, we are, of course, very committed to allowing our licensees the ability to correct conditions, but we are also very committed to public safety, right, and ensuring that dangerous um, equipment violations be corrected timely uh, and also to TLC's robust standards. Um, currently, our enforcement officers do retain the discretion to issue summonses for very dangerous 
for dangerous equipment violations, uh, and they do have the option to issue notice of violations for you know less serious, non-safety related violations, equipment violations specifically. Uh, in terms of TLC's uh, position on correction, we do believe that as the most active taxi and limousine regulatory agency in the country, um, that we are best equipped to inspect the vehicles and ensure that these corrections are made. Okay. I appreciate that. And I understand your objection now. Um, and I understand Oath's concern. Uh, we are the most active city council in the country, and we've heard your concern. And in my view, um, and in I believe, I don't want to speak for the chair, it's his bill, um, and he is uh, certainly uh, able to speak on his own behalf. But in my view, and the reason that I signed on to this bill, um, is that I believe that the TLC does not need to have this mm -hmm. foot on the neck of the driver with respect to a busted taillight. And I agree with you, serious equipment violations need to be addressed seriously. But when I get into my car, I don't know necessarily if my brake light is working or not. It's very difficult to check if my brake light is working because that would require me to put my foot on the brake and also reach behind me with my head to look at the back of my car to see if my brake light is on. It's not something that somebody who's uh, shorter than 14 feet uh, uh, is able to do. So sometimes, sometimes it happens that somebody gets into a car, starts his or her engine, starts to drive, and then taps the brake and doesn't realize that their left brake light is out. It just, it happens from time to time. And what we're saying is, on those occasions, when a TLC officer has a quota to meet and nails a guy for having a missing brake light and gives him a summons, that that person can then get that corrected within 24 hours, up to a half hour after sunset, get a piece of paper that proves that it was done, send it off to the court, and the court dismissed the summons. Now, if this is not clear enough in this statute, we can put in a provision that requires you to do that by mail, that requires you to accept it by electronic means, both. We can, we can make it clearer for you. We can, we can do the rules so you don't even have to promulgate any. The reason that we pass broad legislation and allow agencies to promulgate rules is to kind of, you know, take the guesswork out of it. But if what, the, if what Oath is telling us, if what the court is telling us today is that it's not clear enough what the intent of this council is, then we can surely amend this statute to require you to accept it by an electronic upload or a fax or an email and that you administratively dismiss it by having a clerk do it. We can even specify the title of the clerk. We can do all these kinds of things, but we like to let agencies run themselves. Here, I think what we're saying very clearly, and in case this is not clear to TLC, we are taking that authority away from you to have the driver come back the next day and flick his lights on and off. What we're saying is give the guy the summons. He now knows he has to fix it. He's got to do it within 24 hours or within the next business day. Oath will dismiss the summons, and I, I don't know how we can possibly be more clear, but I hope, I hope that the chairman from today's testimony will go back to the, uh, with the drafters, and maybe we can make this statute a little more clear so that there's no confusion at the end. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and TLC, we're actually very open to uh, collaborating with the committee to make sure that the, the text of 991 uh, is acceptable to, to all. We don't need it to be acceptable to you. We passed the laws here. You just have to read them and enforce them. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Council Member Yeager, uh, when I'm done here in three years from now, I'm going to hire you as my lawyer. Uh, Thank you, uh, Councilmember Yeager. Let me just acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Bain Kalos. Uh, look, I've read uh, both of your testimonies today. Uh, we will continue uh, negotiations and speaking back and forth. To I, I believe at the end of the day, uh, we want the same thing, which is safety uh, and fairness. 
uh, and I believe that both of them could uh, coexist uh, together. And so we're gonna look closely and we'll be getting back to you uh, and be able to have a fruitful dialogue that I think at the end of the day, uh, we could come up with something that, uh, that is gonna be fruitful and beneficial. And with that, if we don't have any more questions, thank you so much uh, to the administration. We got one more panel. Um, I'm gonna call uh, from Peter Meiser from Met Metropolitan Taxi Cab Board of Trade and Marco Connor from Transportation Alternative. And you can begin as soon as you're ready. All right. You can begin. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee and Chairman Cabrera. My name is Peter Mazur, and I'm general counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Cab Board of Trade. We represent the owners and operators of about 5,000 medallion taxi cabs and operate a full service driver's resource serv center. From 1998 to 2004, I served as, uh, with the Taxi and Limousine Commission first as an administrative law judge, then as its chief judge, and finally as its general counsel. Uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit from my written remarks because I did not address the light bill. And I just want to make one comment that uh, as someone who probably handles more light violation summonses than anybody else in the city of New York based on the 5,000 medallion uh, taxi cabs we represent, the procedure that the TLC has in place right now where we bring the car in for inspection and don't get a summons issue is working fine. Um, we do not do a service to any of our drivers and any of our owners by having them go to oath. Oath is, uh, for a driver to go to oath, is all day process. I don't care what uh, the tribunal will tell you. If you walk in and you have a hearing at 10 o'clock, if you're out of there by three o'clock, you're lucky. Uh, and that's every day, seven, five days a week. It never varies. You don't wanna go to oath. If you can avoid going to oath, um, that would be great if there are procedures in place that you, if you get a summons and you want to have it administratively dismissed without ha requiring a physical appearance at oath, that would be good. The second point just on that bill that I want to make is you apply it to drivers. Most summonses are issued to owners who are not necessarily the drivers. Drivers are not responsible for fixing the car, so you don't do the driver a service if you make the driver pay for something he doesn't have to pay. The driver if he's not the owner of the car, if there's a defect, he brings it back to the garage, the garage is responsible to pay it. The garage should get the summons. Drivers shouldn't even get summonses for operating with defect, effective lights. The summonses belong to the vehicle owner. And Mr. That's Mazur, I, I, I thank you very much, and I'm sorry yeah. for interjecting. Sure. I'll let you continue, and I appreciate the chair's indulgence. We signaled, uh, <laughs> and he, he let me do this. But, yeah. um, uh, and I apologize, I have a dentist appointment that I must run to. It's a root mm. canal, so forgive me. Sure. Maybe some of my aggressiveness was coming off <laughs> earlier. Um, but, but our point about this, uh, and I believe why, why we're looking at this, is we're trying to figure out a way to make the, the experience easier. We don't want a driver sitting in court all day, okay? Um, but I think that it is likely possible that a driver is driving a car, TLC car, licensed vehicle has a broken rear uh, brake light and does get pulled over and receives a summons. And what we're trying to say is that if that should happen, if that should happen, we want to give them the out at oath. And perhaps we do need to clar clarify, as uh, my interaction with oath indicated, that this should be some kind of a mail-in 
a written submission program where you could just kind of staple the summons to the letter, send it into oath, it gets administratively dismissed without ever having to show up there. I think that's really the intent. It, the intent is not to force a driver to go down to oath, but the intent is to give the driver the ability to get this administratively dismissed without a back and forth between TLC, uh, the driver, and oath as the administrative law court. Um, with regard to the TLC's process, you still have to go down to the TLC and flick the lights on and off and let the TLC look at it. What we're trying to develop is, uh, is a way where this can be done by paper and where the driver doesn't have to physically go back. And if we can ever figure out a way, and maybe you can offer a suggestion, not today, but maybe you can correspond with the chair whose bill it is and, and uh, say, you know, what makes more sense. But I think the goal here is that the driver gets the summons for something that, that's really simple. Not, not, them, not that he's driving with his bumper hanging off and taped together with duct tape, but that he's got a broken tail light, he didn't notice it, so simple to fix, let's get it done, let's get him back on the road and you know, end his misery for the day. Any suggestion that you can offer that accomplishes that, I think will be welcome. Yeah, well, we will work on that and we will put together some suggestions. And I apologize I mean, that I do have to leave no, early, I, but uh, I have your testimony, I will read it. Thank you. Of course. You. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. The testimony's Chairman. on the other bill. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member. Okay, now I, uh, okay. I, Go for it. Yeah, I'll jump now to the, uh, no to the other bill. Um, and I'm sitting here before you, a critical driver program was created in 1998, and you're looking at the author. I wrote the critical driver program, the very program that uh, you're now working to repeal and consolidate with the TLC-based permanent uh, persistent violator program. I drafted the critical driver rule in 1998 because we were then in a crisis with many dangerous drivers on the road and with no clear mechanism for the TLC to suspend or revoke their licenses. At the time, TLC staff argued to the commissioners that this program was needed because the Department of Motor Vehicles and its Traffic Violations Bureau were ineffective at suspending and revoking unsafe drivers. We argued at the time that without the proposed critical driver program, the TLC did not have a mechanism readily at its disposal to keep dangerous drivers from transporting passengers for hire. While it was evident to me and other TLC staff that this rule was absolutely needed to keep the public safe, the commissioners did not vote to pass the rule, believing it was duplicative of other provisions of law and unfair to drivers. But the TLC did not give up, and in 1999, the commissioners reconsidered and passed rules establishing the first critical driver program. At the time, we celebrated this accomplishment as a major step in protecting the riding public. Subsequent changes were made over to the rules over time, including amendments approved by the City Council and local law, but the general concept has remained the same. Get DMV points on your license or your TLC license is in jeopardy of suspension and revocation. Nineteen years later, I'm before you today to urge the repeal of the very program that I helped to create. I also urge you not to replace it with a program that simply combines a driver's DMV points with his TLC points. And if I believed for one minute that discontinuing this practice of suspending or revoking drivers based on accumulation of, DM of DMV points would in any way whatsoever make the public less safe or allow more dangerous drivers to be on the road, I would, not be, I would be joining the chorus of those who are urging the re its retention through this bill. But unlike 19 years ago, when it was necessary for the TLC to discipline drivers based on the accumulation of DMV points, today this is no longer necessary. In fact, penalizing drivers for DMV points, including points accrued in their personal vehicles, is unnecessary, redundant, it deprives drivers of due process, and in fact, does nothing to get unsafe drivers off the road. So what has changed? The first big change occurred when the City Council enacted provisions which are now codified as 19.512.1 of the Administrative Code, granting the TLC broad powers to summarily suspend and ultimately revoke any driver who the TLC believes is a threat to public safety. The TLC can commence a proceeding before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings to revoke a license for any act it deems unsafe, irrespective of the driver's prior record and irrespective of the number of points a driver may have. Indeed, in just the past several months, the TLC has used its powers to seek revocation of driver's license who committed no violation other than red light camera violations, a violation which carries zero points under the state law. I may disagree with the TLC's use of red light camera tickets in this manner, but I agree that the TLC has broad powers to commence revocation proceedings against any licensee it deems to be a threat to the public. 
That driver goes before an independent oath judge and receives a hearing, and the judge will determine if the driver is a threat to the public, and the chairperson gets to review the driver's recommendation. What else has changed is that the disciplining of drivers based on per se accumulation of DFB points, there is no determination regarding a driver's fitness or threat to the public before he or she is stripped of the license. All that you need is a calculator and a calendar. If you have the requisite points within a, few, uh, within a certain period, you are guilty, end of story. No review of your record. No determination on whether your record makes you an unsafe driver. If you have been previously suspended by DMV for the same violation, it does not matter. With the TLC, you are punished again. What has also changed is that unlike in 1999, we see today at Traffic Violations Bureau, hearing officers are far more likely to impose suspensions and revocations for repeat offenders. And since 2004, every driver who accumulated six DMV points also faces a mandatory driver uh, responsibility assessment from DMV. The net result, pay a fine or get suspended. At the MTBOT Driver Center, last year we handled 1,668 traffic court summonses. About 40% of these are dismissed, which tells you something about the tribunal and the, and the, and the, and the accuracy of the, tra uh, the Traffic Violations Bureau, but that's not before you because this uh, body has no control over a state agency. But before we do anything, when we look at, at the accumulation of DMV points, we have to see, the look at the tribunal where they're accumulated. Of the, of the remaining people who were convicted last year, 31 were, received DMV suspensions or revocations. And in every one of those uh, convictions, the hearing officer reviewed the entirety of the driver's record, including when the offenses occurred and made a determination as to penalty, including possible suspension or revocation. That's done in every single traffic case where there is a conviction, even if it's a conviction for zero points. And every driver involved in a serious accident will attend a DMV safety hearing, which can result in license revocation. So the DMV and its Traffic Violations Bureau arm today is taking bad driving far more seriously than it did 19 years ago. Under the critical driver program of today, most drivers settle for a fine in lieu of suspension or revocation. While I applaud the Commission for offering these settlements and softening the harsh effects of the rule, it belies the argument that critical driver is a necessary public safety tool. It becomes a cost of doing business. During the past uh, two years, we handled 258 critical driver uh, cases. 53% of these were dismissed. So that again tells you something about the quality of, uh, of the summons that is being written. This was generally because the driver took a defensive driving course or the computer that generated the summons miscalculated the points, because nobody's looking at what the record is, just a computer. Of the 120 cases in which drivers were found in violation, there were 29 30-day suspensions imposed, 15 drivers were revoked, the remainder 76 drivers paid a fine and continued driving. If the commission believed any one of those drivers presented a threat to public safety, it could have re uh, commenced revocation proceedings. Let me say this again. Let's get unsafe drivers off the road. We all agree on that, and I'm not standing or sitting before you today anyway advocating for anything but public safety. But let's give every driver a fair hearing and an opportunity to defend his or her record. But again, penalizing drivers per se for DMV points, including points accrued in their personal vehicles, is unnecessary, redundant, deprives drivers of due process, and in fact, does nothing to get unsafe drivers off the road. Uh, I'm not attacking the Persistent Violator Program. That's a TLC-based program. It has assigned points. Drivers are, are fully aware of the system. Uh, TLC license, licensees should obey TLC rules. TLC licensees should not be penalized because of, uh, of activities that happen, not necessarily in a TLC licensed vehicle, but maybe in their private vehicle. And before uh, a tribunal, which has a questionable record, let's say, of providing due process and fairness to its drivers in cases where points are accumulated. And if, if the panel has any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. And I thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify this morning, this afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Carrera, Council Member Powers, and thank you for the opportunity to testify for you today on this really important issue. My name is Mark O'Connor. I am Deputy Director with Transportation Alternatives. We strongly support the amended A version of this legislation, intro 1249A. Uh, we must absolutely keep the critical driver program. 
making sure the drivers are operating safely and improving drivers' working conditions are not mutually exclusive. I want to thank you, Chairman, for amending the original bill, the language of which we believe did not reflect your actual intent to streamline TLC's enforcement programs on behalf of for hire vehicle drivers. And we are encouraged by your concern for both TLC licensed drivers' livelihoods and for victims of traffic violence and safety on our streets. And we fully support your commitment and quest to address both issues. The critical driver program has helped save lives by holding professional drivers to a higher standard. Under this program in 2018, more than 2,000 TLC licensed drivers had their licenses suspended and more than 800 had their licenses revoked for dangerous driving. This pales in comparison to the enforcement capability of the TLC's second most effective enforcement program, the Persistent Violator Program, which yielded just over 100 suspensions and no more than a handful of revocations in 2018, that same year. Replacing the former program with the latter would have made our streets less safe for everyone, including drivers themselves and their families. And despite the success of Vision Zero in our city, with consistent reductions in traffic fatalities, which has bucked the national trend of alarmingly increasing traffic fatalities during that same period since 2013, New Yorkers are still killed at tragic rates and are exposed to unacceptable dangers when simply walking, biking, or driving. These are dangers that result overwhelmingly from speeding, from failing to yield to pedestrians, and distracted driving. In 2017, drivers licensed by the TLC were involved in at least 30 fatal crashes. That's an increase of approximately five deaths from 2016. So from five to 30, from 2016 to 17. None of those drivers, not a single one, lost their TLC license that year. Citywide, 222 people died in traffic last year in, in 2018. And since 2001, more than 5,000 people have died in crashes on city streets, with more than 60,000 people injured every single year. Dangerous driver choices are the primary cause or a contributing factor in 70% of pedestrian facilities. People of color and low-income New Yorkers are up to three times more likely to, to be struck and injured by motor vehicles, and as such, stand to gain, gain the most from effective enforcement by the TLC. Addressing this epidemic of carnage and suffering is a responsibility that is shared by all. Profe professional drivers, in particular, have the greatest responsibility. They spend more time in traffic and, through their driving, lead the way for either more reckless or safer driving by all New Yorkers. And in closing, I want to thank you again, Council Member, for your commitment to this issue. Um, we urge this committee and the full Council to ensure that the important work by the TLC to protect New Yorkers is strengthened and not diminished in your laudable and important quest for justice and safety on behalf of all New Yorkers, including for hire vehicle drivers. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for those words. I really appreciate it, and thank you both of you for championing uh, safety uh, for all your efforts. You are not new kids in the block. You have worked uh, for many, many, many years. I did have a couple of questions uh, really quickly. You mentioned that, uh, I, I didn't know these numbers uh, before, people of color and low income, New Yorkers are up to three times more likely to be struck and injured by motor vehicles. Uh, do you happen to know why is that the case? So th there's a number of reasons uh, why we believe that, that uh, that happens. Um, one is, you can see just on the, along the eastern side of Manhattan, um, we did a study in 2011 called essentially the unequal burden of tri child traffic crashes, which showed that um, on the upper east side of Manhattan compared, well, uh, on the, in East Harlem and Spanish Harlem and in the lower east side, children were three times more likely to be struck than children in the Upper, upper East Side, right? Uh, so with those two higher crash locations being to the north and to the south. And there is a difference in, in, uh, in wealth in, um, in those uh, locations. And there is a high, con high concentration of public housing 
um, north and south of the Upper East Side, and often accompanying um, public housing, you often have wide streets, uh, and you also have a uh, lack of space, uh, green space, place for, for children to play. Um, and with wider streets also usually comes uh, more speeding. Um, another factor that we don't have specific, specific data for New York City on, but we, have, we see it elsewhere in the US, is that uh, in high income areas in US cities uh, that have far more sidewalks, there is a far lower, um, far lower rates of people being struck while walking compared to lower income areas in those cities that have a far lower uh, rate and presence of sidewalks. Um, so again, we haven't looked at the data specifically in New York City to back up the, the notion that, um, that there's an underinvestment in safe infrastructure, um, but we believe that could certainly be part of the reason why. You know, that would be an interesting study uh, for the study uh, to really look at all the variables and breaking down as to the SAC reasons because then we could have strategies in the city and investments that will follow to make sure that our pedestrians, you know, are safe. I had a question for both of you, and uh, let me recognize who will be uh, joined by Council Member uh, Dennis Rodriguez, who's the, also the Chair of Transportation uh, uh, Committee, being a leader in the forefront when it comes to safety as well. Uh, and that you were here for the administration's uh, testimony. Any feedback regarding uh, their testimony? Anything that you can see uh, that we can make these bills better? You want to go first? No, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I think I've made myself clear on the critical driver piece and where I stand and where we stand with respect to uh, point based. Uh, uh, Re suspensions and revocations for offenses that are outside of the control of the Taxi and Limousine Commission and outside of the control really of the city because the city has no control over what goes on at the tra uh, Traffic Violations Bureau. On the other bill, uh, I think my uh, suggestions, w which uh, will probably follow up further, is that it needs to cover both owners and drivers because most, uh, to make it clear that it's the owner who has the responsibility of repairing the vehicle, not the driver. And we don't want to shift the burden to a, uh, a driver who doesn't own a vehicle to uh, undertake an expensive repair on, on a vehicle to avoid a summons. Uh, I'm very clear on this. I don't believe that drivers who don't own the vehicle should ever get summonses for one light out or something like that. That summons belongs to the owner. The owner owns the car. The owner is responsible for maintaining the car. And I do support, uh, I, I did say I, I find that the system that's in place now uh, with respect to, at least with taxi cabs where you bring the car in uh, to correct the notice and don't get a summons issued is working fine. Uh, it can be modified a little bit if there's a, a way of accepting, uh, you know, uh, acceptable proof. The problem is that a lot of the taxi cabs are operated through garages and so they're not going to get a repair bill. They're going to bring the car back to the to their own garage and the, the mechanic is going to uh, uh, fix the, the problem. Now do you want the mechanic to sign an affidavit that he did it or take a picture of it or whatever it can work. Uh, right now we have the system where we go to the TLC and it's working fine. Uh, I'd like to see a, a, a more robust program that where summons is and I agree that when summonses are issued, and if they're issued by police or they're issued by another agency, I like to see those dismissed if there's a, a, a repair within a reasonable period of time. Um, th just a, a, a little bit of a clarification. Uh, everybody assumes that the system works 100% correctly at the, uh, at the Traffic Violations Bureau, that if you get a, 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 an equipment violation, and you correct it within 24 hours, you go to traffic court and the summons is dismissed, I can tell you that doesn't always happen. There are times the judges will look at the repair bill and say, oh, um, I'm not going to accept it, I don't like it, or something like that. And there are, we, we do see a number of drivers and uh, vehicle owners who have been found guilty of violations even though they thought they had a, a timely uh, repair. So that system isn't perfect. 
I, I think we can work out with a, a system. I think we're all in agreement that, th that what we want to see is nobody paying a fine per se if they make a timely repair on a, uh, a, a relatively minor equipment defect. I think we're all in agreement on that. It's just how we get to that point that's going to be essential. Appreciate that feedback. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. So specifically to intro 991, we, we fully support in, in, in principle the ability to bring your vehicle into compliance and then avoid the, uh, a penalty. The goal of, of any enforcement should never be penalizing in and of itself. It should always be to deter dangerous behavior or to correct dangerous conditions. And so in principle, we, we support that probably with some of the um, mod modifications that have been mentioned. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you both. Thank you uh, for being champions, uh, veterans, uh, Keith, uh, the fantastic work that you're doing, your respective uh, organizations. And with that, uh, no more questions. Uh, we conclude today's hearing.